facts in international law uh, by uh, Lex Takenberg and uh, Francesca Albanese. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Rights Forum and PAX, uh, I would like to welcome everyone. My name is Marjolein Beinings. Uh, I'm the program lead for the Middle East at PAX, and I will be hosting uh, this webinar. Uh, before we start, I have a few practical um, uh, points of information. Uh, first of all, uh, we have English Arabic interpretation available. Uh, you can uh, get Arabic translation by clicking on the Japanese language uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, Um, a second point um, is that this webinar is being recorded uh, and is being live streamed. We will start uh, in a bit uh, with presentations uh, by the authors of the book. So uh, uh, the book Palestinian Refugees in International Law which is a very timely publication um, on an issue that is at the core of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, they have uh, prepared a second um, edition of a book that Lex Stockenberg published uh, 22 years ago, and a lot of developments happened since then. And uh, we will hear more about this new version later on. So we will first start with presentations by Lex Stockenberg and Francesca Albanese. Then we have uh, two uh, distinguished panelists who will comment on the book. Uh, first of all, Moeen Rabani, and then uh, Professor Marcel Br Brus. And then at the end of the webinar, there will be an opportunity for you um, to ask questions. You can share your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and if time and space allows, we may provide the ability for some people to to ask your question live on screen if you want that. So you can indicate that uh, uh, with your question if we, you would like to be on video, but otherwise you can just type your question and we will read it out uh, and, and pose it to one of the, the panelists. Um, we will also share in the chat information on how you can purchase the book and where you can find more information uh, on the book. And then we will end around three o'clock. Uh, so first of all, we will start with the two authors uh, of the book, uh, Francesca Albanese and, uh, and Lex Stuckenberg. Um, Francesca Albanese is a research affiliate uh, for the study of international migration at Georgetown University, and she's a visiting scholar at the Esam Faris Institute for Public Studies uh, uh, and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut. She's an international lawyer specialized in human rights and refugee issues in the Arab world. She has 15 years of professional experience working with the United Nations Relief and Works Agencies for uh, Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, the U European Union and the UN Development Programme and different NGOs. The other author of the book is uh, Dr. Lex Takenberg, who has worked with UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees from 1989 until late 2019. And he is currently a freelance lecturer and consultant. He is the former chief of the UNRWA Ethics Office. And prior to that, he held positions including UNRWA's general counsel, director of operations and deputy field director and field director positions in Gaza and Syria. Before joining UNRWA, he was the legal officer of the Dutch Refugee Council for six years. So Lex, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mayor Lane, and greetings from the SV Nikaya in the port of Nice. Can you all hear me okay? Francesca yes. and I are honored to have this opportunity to present our book today. 
let me begin by thanking PAX and the Rights Forum for hosting the event. Our thanks also extend to all of you joining today and a special word of appreciation goes to Moin Rabani and Marshall Bruss for agreeing to share some of their views on the, on the subject. When I first, when I wrote the first edition of the book in the 1990s, originally my PhD thesis for the University of Nijmegen, there was already lots of literature about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including legal works, but very little specifically about the people at the heart of the conflict, Palestinian refugees. As a young lawyer, working with the Dutch Refugee Council first and then UNRWA, I had considerable difficulty in understanding why Palestinian refugees were the only group of force displaced with a different, different treatment to other refugees under the international refugee regime. The book I wrote in 1998 was the first attempt to comprehensively analyze the various legal aspects of the Palestinian refugee question and their distinct status under international law. The first edition, written at the time of the Middle East peace process, reflected the optimism of the time, including the expectation of the establishment of a Palestinian state, which many believed would help resolve the refugee question. This optimism proved unfounded and almost every political development since the Oslo breakthrough has adversely affected Palestinians, both those under the yoke of the Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip, West Bank and East Jerusalem, and the refugees at large. One of the few positive developments brought about by the Middle East peace process has been the increase of legal literature and research on the Palestinian refugee question by scholars and practitioners and Palestinian refugee organizations like Badil and Aydul. However, this new research focused on either the situation of Palestinian refugees in specific countries, for example, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon or in Egypt, on their specific rights, for example, the right to return, the right to compensation, or on the protection gap affecting Palestinian refugees owing to the exceptional regime embodied by UNRWA and UNCCP previously uh, as, as compared with UNHCR. An updated analysis of the Palestinian refugee question as a whole, looking holistically at the historical, legal and political aspects continue to be missing. Also, at a time of increasing attacks against UNRWA, which disingenuously include attacks against the very existence of Palestinian refugees, the difficulty of researching UNRWA for people who had not experienced it from within was an obstacle to fully appreciate both challenges and opportunities of the regime set up for these refugees. So while, whilst I continue to work with UNRWA, it gradually dawned on me that it would be important to update the book. As I dreaded having to embark on years of solitary confinement once again to accomplish the task, I decided to look for a co-author. That turned out to be a complex undertaking as I needed a good international lawyer with a solid understanding of the question of Palestine and the Palestinian refugee issue, but also an excellent researcher and networker, as there was a lot of new literature and many more were engaged on the issue than 20 years ago. Last but not least, I needed someone with their heart in the right place. Having worked with Francesca during her tenure with UNRWA, I felt that she might fit the profile. Though it took patience and perseverance to, converse her, to convince her to accept my proposal, she rapidly proved to be the perfect choice. Not only did she agree to be my partner in crime, she also accepted to act as the principal author, taking the lead in the drafting of what essentially became a new book, reflecting the wealth of developments and knowledge that we were able to tap into. For me, the experience was totally different than the mostly solo exercise that the writing of the first edition had been. My role this time was to offer strategic support, to brainstorm with Francesca on how to tackle dilemmas we encountered on the way, to review the various drafts, 
but also to tap into my extensive network of academic and other contacts relevant to the book. The result is a much, much better, much richer book. As she has been the lead author, it is only fair that I ask Francesca to present the book to you. Francesca, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, greetings from Jakarta, where it's already night, as you can see <laughs> from the background. And thank you very much, Pax and uh, the Rights Forum for organizing uh, this event, which I'm, I mean, I would like to stress is the first one where we are, uh, are able to offer a translation in Arabic, which is very important and necessary. Um, and thank you all for being with us today, including the distinguished panelists. Um, of course, also thank you, Lex, for the ever warm and generous introduction about my role as your partner in crime. That is true. I was reluctant in the beginning to take up this uh, the, your your invitation to be your partner in crime, but of course, I mean, as you as the, the those uh, among you who know the question of Palestine and Palestinian refugees in particular would appreciate it's it's quite a daunting task, and I was scared of it. But however, especially after working with Anwa for a few years, I was convinced that there was much more that was to be said on the, the Palestinian refugees, especially the legal dimension of their situation um, and um, for the, not only for the reason that Lex enunciated, but also, but also because I had personally observed uh, working with ANRA how much confusion around their status and rights as refugees and stateless persons among others could impact the life of millions of them. I observed that discrimination against Palestinian refugees Beyond cases in other countries where discrimination is even institutionalized, uh, often originates, originates from genuine confusion about who Palestinian refugees are and what is the international protection in their case. But also, uh, this, this confusion helps uh, those who manipulate legal arguments to advance a political agenda at the expense of Palestinian refugees. I realized that through this new book, we had a unique opportunity to contribute to the debate on the Palestinian refugee question, building, as Lex said, on the new, on the research, on the existing research, um, and also on the new research that we embarked on, clarifying areas that remained misunderstood, and ultimately bringing the question of Palestinian refugees and their unmet rights to the fore. It is with this at heart that we wrote Palestinian Refugees in International Law, which is in essence a new book building on the foundation of the first edition. Like the first edition, the book aims to offer a comprehensive overview of the Palestinian refugee question in international law, including its origins and devolutions, the special arrangements the UN put in place for these refugees, and the extent to which international law is relevant to their protection and the pursuit of solution in theory and in practice. Um, we enriched the first edition with new archival, doctrinal, doctrinal and field research with an extensive survey of the Palestinian refugees or Palestinians in the diaspora at large and their experience across the fragmentation of the exile, uh, surveying national and regional practices, jurisprudence and case law across uh, uh, five continents, and a holistic approach to international law, trying to think out of the box, box, focusing on specific challenges and ways to overcome them, as well as opportunities that remain untapped. Of course, we have no illusions that international per se cannot provide an easy way out of the current impasse in Israel-Palestine case, but we do point to it to international law as a way to challenge the current state of affairs and re-establish a principle order at various levels. The books contain many new findings and in the interest of time, I'll try to give you a sort of impressionistic overview of some of them around four main areas. So first, compared to the first edition, this new book engages in a deeper and more organic legal exploration of the events that befell Palestine and its people from the last days of the Ottoman Empire, when political Zionism laid its ambition on this land through the decades of the British mandate 
Still, the unrest and war in 1947-49 triggered by the UN plan to partition Palestine between the mostly European Jews and the indigenous Arabs in Palestine. And through the Israeli occupation of what remained of Palestine that commenced in 1967, still present day dispersal. We systematically discuss numbers, wave of arrivals, status and treatment of Palestinian refugees or rather Palestinian, the Palestinian diaspora at large in over 50 countries in the MENA region, but also in Europe, the Americas, the Asia Pacific and Africa, where numbers of Palestinian refugees are increasingly moving and invisibly moving. Uh, this picture of, Palest of the Palestinian dispersal is to our knowledge, um, the most complete currently available. We warn the reader that the lack of proper recording and proper information of Palestinian refugees in national system always, may, um, not always often makes them statistically invisible. And the lack of, uh, the lack of accessible data in certain countries uh, blurs the overall picture. Hopefully, this will just uh, inspire further research, including on the discrimination that the Palestinians endure and their consequences. For example, little discusses the fact that at least 700,000 um, uh, Palestinian refugees, many children and grandchildren of those who were originally displaced primarily in 1948, but also in 1967, have cumulatively been displaced often in the context of a right or outright persecution from within the Arab world from the, the, the 1970s onward, following tragic turns of events in Lebanon, in Kuwait and the other Gulf countries, but also in Libya, in Iraq, and most lately and tragically in Syria. This doesn't take into account the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians that Israel has additionally displaced since 1967. Together with increasing hardship in accessing international protection in Europe and North America, hostility in the Arab world um, is pushing Palestinian refugees toward what we call the new frontiers of their exile. And one example is Southeast Asia, where I live, where Palestinians arrive anew as refugees, experiencing all sorts of all the new challenges. The legal overview intertwined with these historical excursions is important not only to understand who Palestinian refugees are and how they became the oldest, largest, and most allegedly uh, intractable refugee situation of modern times, but also to appreciate the continuity between the original Palestinian displacement and present day reality in occupied Palestine and the association challenges for Palestinian refugees everywhere. Um, second, the book provides a new critical analysis of the distinctive regime set by um, the UN for Palestinian refugees within the international refugee framework. And this is a key issue, so I will spend some extra uh, words on it. Uh, but let's start by some apparent facts. Unlike other refugees today, Palestinian refugees are at large um, outside, uh, I mean, not yeah, outside UNHCR's mandate, but rather they fall under UN UNRWA's mandate. And second, unlike any other refugee today, Palestinian refugees at large do not fall within the purview of Article 1A, second paragraph of the 1951 Refugee Convention which defines refugee as persons being outside of their country and unable or unwilling to return out of their persecution. But they fall under Article 1D of the convention, which is commonly and erroneously referred to as excluding to core Palestinian refugee from the protection of the 1951 convention. These facts have led to one of the greatest misconceptions in refugee studies, that Palestinian refugees are lesser refugees than other, like someone said, uh, sons of a lesser God, and therefore entitled to different or no protection of refugees at all. This is factually and legally wrong. Palestinian refugees were displaced en masse from historical Palestine in connection with the creation of the state of Israel and subsequent events such as 1967, including their descendants, are protracted refugees by virtue of Article 1D. And please bear with me here. This article provisionally excludes from the benefits of the convention, the 1951 convention, refugees who are assisted and protected by other UN agencies, meaning UNHCR, but extend them 
the benefit of the convention and so UNHCR assistance, whenever the alternative arrangements become non-applicable or cease before their situation is definitely settled. I admit that the wording of this article is not very clear, but its, um, its meaning makes full sense when interpreted in line with the drafting history of the Refugee Convention, which is a legal tool for treaty interpretation. In a nutshell, this article, which is foundational to the status of Palestinian refugees in international law, reflect what we call Palestinian refugees' distinctiveness within the international refugee framework. This distinctiveness has historical and political reasons. In, 19, in 1949, while the drafting of the 1951 convention and UNHCR statement where it was being finalized, uh, the United Nations General Assembly with Resolution 194 of 1948 had already decided how to resolve the conflict in Palestine. First and foremost, by establishing the UN Conciliation Commission for Palestine, which I will refer to as UNCCP, with the aim of negotiating a solution to the conflict over Palestine, including the refugee problem. And, uh, and Francesca, Europe... I'm sorry yes. to, uh, to interrupt, but could you speak a little bit slower because of the interpretation? Sorry, yes. Thank you. <laughs> And the scheme for durable solution for Palestinian refugees through the return of those uh, willing to live at peace with their Jewish neighbors and the provision of compensation for those choosing to resettle elsewhere. And this, of course, had to be facilitated by the UNCCP. As peace proved unattainable in the short term, the mechanism where um, other, me sorry, other mechanisms were created to provide uh, urgently needed relief to the refugees. The most lasting one was UNRWA. UNRWA's original functions were geared toward material assistance to the refugees and support to UNCCP's work toward solution. This is how the alternative arrangements, which the 1951 convention implicitly refers to, came into existence. All the more, Unlike most refugees from World War II, who at the time of uh, the 1951 convention was adopted, were still to be admitted to safe countries. Palestinian refugees had already been given de facto asylum in other countries, and they did not want to be resettled out of their homeland. The majority of them wanted to return. And so their protection entailed return to their homes, which included preserving the properties and assets they had left behind, or assistance to be resettled elsewhere and compensated. Something that UNCCP and ANWA were precisely and exactly geared to do. This is the situation that was recognized by the drafters of the 1951 convention. As there were already institutional arrangements in place for Palestinian refugees with mandates that were tailored to their specific situation and needs, there was no reason to duplicate. But it was provided that should these arrangements no longer work before their question, their attention piece is definitely settled, then the convention and UNHCR's mandate would apply. This is the meaning of Article 1D. In a nutshell, the 1951 convention was not meant to exclude Palestinian refugees from the enjoyment of rights of refugees, but just provided that those rights were to be taken care of by UNCCP and UNRWA, which in a way, especially UNCCP, predated UNHCR. And this was until the question of Palestine is definitely settled. And this is also why Palestinian refugees are protected across generations. This is just to clarify the issue that is often raised that Palestinian refugees, I mean, the descendants of the original Palestinian refugees in 1948 are not legitimate refugees. No, they are. Our analysis of the Palestinian refugee question in the context and not as opposed to other refugee situations allows to appreciate that 70 years ago, ad hoc solutions to refugee problems like ANRWA and UNCCP were part of the institutional culture of the UN response to refugee situation. They were not an exception. Even UNHCR 
and the 1951 Convention were initially envisaged for European and Soviet Union refugees, the territorial partitions generated refugee crises, such as the Palestinian, but also the Korean, the Indian, Pakistani, were all beyond the scope of UNHCR and the Refugee Convention. The only exception compared to the other, these other cases is that the Palestinian question was never resolved. Unlike the others, the Palestinians have yet to enjoy a full, sovereign, independent state, and many have remained in a limbo, with no return and no resettlement, and mostly stateless. In light of this, we invested quite a bit of time on clarifying who is a, Palestine, a Palestinian refugee under international law, the banking, the myth that there is no definition of who Palestinian refugees are. Protected under international law are those who are displaced in connection with the 1948 and 1967 events, and their question is still to be settled in line with UN resolutions. In this story, you, you, you realize UNCCP, whose peacekeeping functions were brought to an end in the early 60s, is an incredibly important actor, which is not adequately known and understood. Further to its uh, fatal demise, we have assisted to a significant evolution of UNRWA's functions and a cooperation with uh, UNHCR. Nowadays, both agencies interpret their mandate vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian refugees as complementary rather than antithetical or contradictory. Accordingly, UNRWA is responsible for Palestine refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, and UNHCR is responsible for them um, those displaced in 1948 and 1967, as well as new refugees, when they find themselves in need of international protection outside UNRWA's areas of operations for objective reasons. Of course, the system is far from effective and must be improved. But until now, the debate on the protection of Palestinian refugees has largely focused on UNRWA being unequipped or ill-equipped to protect Palestinian refugees, and this being part and parcel of the protection gap for these refugees. We try to overcome this, and after analyzing the evolution of both UNRWA and UHCR um, and their protection role vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian refugees and their little-known strategic cooperation, we propose a number of measures for both agencies within their sphere of competence uh, to put in place a watertight protection system hinging on the realization of the rights as a priority and then determining who's the best to serve them. Our hope is that other scholars and practitioners will constructively join the debate. Third, the book provides the first in-depth analysis of the Palestinian refugee question in line with the various areas of international law and their interplay. And this has two components. We discuss the general relevance to uh, Palestinian refugees of various bodies of international law. For example, international humanitarian law, given the fact that not only was the Palestinian refugee question born out of conflict and so humanitarian law applied in 1947-49, but also because conflict has afflicted the many uh, sorry, has afflicted the experience of many Palestinian refugees in the occupied Palestinian territory, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria. So the implication of IHL violations may be relevant to those seeking redress and accountability, for example, including through uh, universal jurisdiction. Second, the law concerning statelessness, which is important, and not only for the refugees who were denationalized and mass by Israel in 1954 in violation of prevailing principles of international law of state succession in force at that time, but also because the enduring statelessness of most Palestinians since 1948 uh, is largely due to political reasons. And of course, we, we discussed this uh, in detail in the book. Third, we analyze how international human rights law potentially offers the broadest scope of protection to Palestinians who are in a protracted refugee situation, especially 
to the refugees living in countries that have not ratified the 1951 Convention, but where the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on Civil and Political Rights, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, etc., are largely ratified. The recommendations of treaty bodies and special rapporteurs with regard to Palestinian refugees in Arab countries, as well as in Europe, um, that we have analyzed comprehensively for the first time, are a tool to ensure greater scrutiny of national practices vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian refugees. And fourth, with regard to um, refugee law, in addition, to explaining the regime set up by Article 1D, which I mentioned, hoping for a greater coherence around it. The book explores the significance of recent development in refugee law and practice to Palestinian refugees, including to break the political impasse. And this is my fourth and last point, which I will soon get to after concluding that in light of these various branches of international law and their interplay, the book also offers an in-depth analysis of many of their rights, such as the right of self-determination, which is not common to refugee studies, but is essential for situations like the Palestinian refugees and others that we can refer to later, uh, where um, the, their foundation of the refugee status couples with a denial of self-determination. Uh, but also we analyze in detail the right of return, the right to compensation, and other civil, uh, cultural, economic, political, and social rights. Right to return is an example. Before being protected under human rights law as a corollary of the freedom of movement, in the case of Palestine, in the ref uh, Palestinian refugees, this right stems from the prohibition of forced forcible displacement and mass expulsions under the Hague regulations, and which were found to constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity before 1948, as the charters of the Tokyo and Nuremberg tribunals affirmed. And the duty of the responsible state to make reparations to international, for internationally wrongful acts in the form of restitutions and compensation. And these had already been established as a general principle of international law in 1927. Fourth and last point, the book explores what resolving the question of Palestinian refugees in international law uh, may look like. And this part represents a fundamental departure from the first edition in the sense that compared to that, the hope that the Middle East peace process could offer a solution to the Palestinian refugee question is that our main premise is that after seven decades of unsuccessful attempts at resolving the refugee issue, a fundamental paradigm shift in the approach to solutions for Palestinian refugees is needed. So we argue that the UN must assume responsibility for the pursuit of solution for Palestinian refugees, like it ultimately does for other refugee crises, including large and productive ones. Since Oslo, the Palestinian refugee issue has been dominated by the asymmetry of power between the parties. And even before then, political experience has prevailed over the interests of the refugees. This situation must end. And like with all other refugee situations, this is the second point, international law must be the framework and lighthouse for resolving the various aspects of the Palestinian refugee question. The issue of refugee status as a moral, material, individual, and collective justice needs to be addressed. And third, the third element of our proposed paradigm shift addresses the long held belief that pursuing solution for Palestinian refugees more holistically would undermine Palestinians' rights and claims toward Israel, and as such would jeopardize the Palestinian cause. We make it clear that this is not the case at all. For Palestinian refugees, the right to return, restitution and compensation flow from this sort of injustice accompanying the birth of the refugee issue. And these have only become stronger with the passing of time and further advancement of international law. So Palestinian refugees should not fear pursuing solutions more closely in line with the global refugees regime, as many uh, Palestinian, individual Palestinians have done in the years.
And um, I would um, I would stop here because I know that Lex is very keen to uh, to discuss this and um, happy to take questions on the book later on. Thank you very much, Francesca. And yes, I will take the uh, the discussion on you know advancing this paradigm shift that Francesca referred to uh, a bit a bit further. And we, we argue in the book that the New York, the 2016 New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants provides a unique opportunity to realize this paradigm shift. The declaration, unanimously adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2016 in response to the largest refugee crisis since the Second World War, provides a powerful political reaffirmation of the international refugee regime that was put in place after the Second World War and subsequent decades, including the centrality of international law in protecting the human rights and fundamental freedoms of refugees and the approach in promoting durable solutions for refugee situations. The declaration underscores the importance of a systematic and comprehensive response in addressing refugee questions. It calls, among other things, for the development of a comprehensive refugee response framework for each large-scale refugee situation, including protracted ones. These comprehensive refugee response frameworks are to be developed through a multi-stakeholder approach with a key role for national and local authorities, international organizations, international financial institutions, civil society, and last but not least, refugees themselves. It also calls for addressing all aspects of a refugee response, including root causes, ending refugee status and statelessness through a combination of durable solutions and humanitarian assistance. The New York Declaration applies to all refugees, including Palestinian refugees, as appears from a number of references therein to UNRWA. In spite of this, to date, no such framework has been developed for Palestinian refugees. We suggest that this lacuna be addressed at the earliest opportunity, with UNRWA and UNHCR facilitating the process together each with respect to the Palestinian refugees for which it is responsible. We believe that a comprehensive response framework for Palestinian refugees developed under Palestinian leadership, including refugee groups and diaspora networks across the world, has the potential of ending Palestinian exceptionalism and allows for a 72 year old refugee question to be approached anew with the state-of-the-art 21st century toolbox. One may wonder what such a framework, what such a new framework would add to the multiple peace efforts that have been undertaken since the late 1940s, or how it would be different from them. The answer is in the very elements of the comprehensive response framework for Palestinian refugees that we propose in the book. Its value, as Francesca said, being as much in its core elements as in the process of its development. Let me just give you some of its key elements. The framework should first and foremost reaffirm the legal regime applicable to the Palestinian refugee question, comprised of relevant norms of international law, including relevant UN resolution, specifying their meaning and implications. This addresses the first element of our suggested paradigm shift and pays the way to a rights-based discourse on both protection and solution, reconciling rights to return, the right to apply for citizenship in other countries, which has been absent for way too long. The New York Declaration underscores the importance of addressing the root causes of any large-scale displacement, and as such, the development of the framework for Palestinian refugees could provide a setting to initiate under a UN Aegis public discussion on the Palestinian refugee question. This would include both its origin 
and constituing elements, what we refer to as the past, as well as the broader context of the unresolved dispute between Israel and the Palestinians, the present, and the unresolved question of self-determination. Thirdly, addressing the Palestinian refugee question within the framework of international law means aligning the search for solutions with international refugee law and practice. A combination of the durable solutions has helped resolve other protracted refugee situation and could help do so for Palestinian refugees as well. This would not mean relinquishing the right of return, but creating a basis and space for the refugees themselves to discuss its significance whilst exploring solutions more holistically. Finally, the framework will have to address the important issue of restitution and compensation, on which there has been little progress, despite the very important work done by UNCCP and other technical aspects, experts to evaluate all property left behind in 1948. With respect to the development of a comprehensive response framework for Palestinian refugees, I first spoke about the, the elements of it and now about the development. As already mentioned, the New York Declaration calls for a multi-stakeholder approach. In the Palestinian case, this would require the mobilization of a wide and diverse front of supporters of the framework, including the UN, host countries, both in UNRWA's area of operations and other countries that host a significant number of Palestinian refugees, donors, as well as civil society. The Palestinian political leadership and the refugees must have a central process. It should entail consultation at national, regional, international levels, structured engagement with refugees and host countries, and exploration of the feasibility of various solutions and other measures. In conclusion, we have no illusion that it's going to be easy, but we believe strongly that this approach would give new impetus to international action in favor of Palestinian refugees and their rights. This does not need to await and could help advance a more positive outlook for the wider political process. Thank you very much so far and back to my land. Thank you very much, uh, Lex and Francesca, for this very rich uh, presentation in which you were able to give us a lot of information in a very short time. Thank you for that. We will move now to our two uh, panelists. Um, first, we will go to Mr. Moin Rabbani, who is a Dutch-Palestinian independent Middle East analyst specializing in Palestinian affairs and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Mr. Rabbani was uh, previously a senior analyst with the International Crisis Group, and uh, he is a senior fellow with the Institute for Palestine Studies. He's a co-editor of Jadalia, and he is a contributing editor to Middle East Report. He has written and commented widely uh, on the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rabbani, um, could you give us uh, your perspective on the momentum for such a paradigm shift and, and such uh, a, a new framework uh, to address the Palestinian refugee issue uh, that was presented by, uh, by Lex and Francesca. Uh, thank you, uh, Marjolein, and um, thank you very much for the organizers of this session um, to discuss the very important publication of, um, of the book by uh, Lex uh, Takenberg and Francesca Albanese. I think it's an important event. Um, what I would like to do is to take a few minutes to um, uh, perhaps reflect on why I think this book is important and to do so not in terms of the actual content of the book, which I think Lex and uh, Francesca have done very well, or in terms of the legal implications of the issues they raise, which um, Professor Bruce will be doing um, next, but rather to focus on the political dimensions. 
And here I think it's important to perhaps um, just take a moment and remind ourselves what we're talking about here, um, which is the longest standing refugee question in the world that involves the largest group of stateless refugees in the world. And it's important to recall um, that this originated in the late 1940s, primarily between um, late 1947 and mid 1949. And whereas researchers often um, uh, present the total number of Palestinian refugees resulting from that war as a percentage of the total Palestinian population, I think it's equally important to, um, uh, to perhaps look at it in more narrow terms. In other words, not what percent of all Palestinians, but rather what percentage of Palestinians in the territory that became the state of Israel were made refugees during that period. And there you will find that at least 70 and up to 90% of all Palestinians in the area that became the state of Israel um, were made refugees during that conflict. And in many regions, of that new state, it was no less than 100%. In other words, we are talking, as I think um, researchers have also demonstrated, about a planned and premeditated and overwhelmingly successful campaign of ethnic cleansing that was undertaken first by the Zionist militias and then by the newly formed military of, um, of, of the Israeli state. Um, uh, the next issue I would like to discuss is how the international community has gone about addressing this issue in the context of, of the so-called um, uh, peace process, which I should perhaps point out I've, I've consistently maintained is a misnomer. Um, if you look at this diplomatic process, whether beginning from uh, the 1970s or more narrowly from the bilateral Israeli-Palestinian diplomatic process that commenced in the early 1990s. What you see is that it was primarily focused on negotiating the terms of autonomy for Palestinians in the occupied territories. And although the refugee question was addressed, for example, in the multilateral consultations, the general approach, I would argue, to the Palestine refugee question was basically to marginalize it and to ensure that the recognition and implementation of Palestinian refugee rights did not intrude on the prospect of a successful autonomy arrangement for the Palestinians in the occupied territories. And interestingly enough, I think the best evidence for this is not so much um, the issues, the, the attempts to um, discuss the fate of the 1948 refugees, but rather those discussions that focused on the so-called displaced persons, people who were um, either expelled or um, prohibited from returning from the West Bank and Gaza Strip. In other words, here we're talking about a group of people who do not even have any claims um, to return to what is recognized as sovereign Israeli territory, but rather to return to um, uh, Palestinian territory that according to the um, uh, presentation of the diplomatic process would have eventually become a Palestinian state. And Israel, and I hate to say it, but with the backing of the Western powers, consistently prohibited any resolution of the fate of even this group of people. And if you can imagine, so if, if you um, examine how difficult it has been to resolve uh, the question of the 1967 displaced Palestinians, imagine how much more unwilling Israel and the international community were during this period to discuss, um, uh, let alone meaningfully address, uh, the question of Palestinian refugees who were dispossessed and uprooted 
in, in the late uh, uh, 1940s. Uh, my next point is that I think it's also very important to um, uh, consider that during the past four years, under the supervision of um, uh, Trump and his uh, son-in-law and jack of all trades, Jared Kushner, there has been a renewed attempt to basically um, remove the Palestinian refugee question from the international agenda, as I think uh, Francesca said, by redefining them out of existence. Many people have focused on the American decision to um, terminate funding for UNRWA, um, and, and that deserves the attention it's received. But at the same time, I think it's important that I, to understand this as part of a much larger and pernicious American agenda, which was um, uh, to openly promote the dissolution of UNRWA and, it, and disbanding it, and to insist on using its power to compel the, the United Nations and the international community to redefine Palestinian refugees so that they effectively cease to exist and that there would no longer um, be an issue that needs to be addressed and resolved. They did this, I think, in an, in an exceptionally vile and vulgar and explicitly um, dishonest uh, fashion. And it has done real damage um, to hundreds of thousands of people's lives. Um, and I think that the United Nations and the international community have held the line, but only just. Um, and, and my concern is that when, and I think it's a matter of when rather than if, um, uh, you get a similar US leader who is distinct from Trump in actually having the competence and intelligence to uh, pursue such an agenda, whether the international community will then have um, the backbone uh, to, to resist such, uh, such efforts. And therefore, I think it's in this broader context um, uh, that a publication like the book published um, by by Lex and Francesca is exceptionally important because it emphasizes once again um, uh, that regardless of all the politics and diplomacy that at the end of the day, um, the Palestine refugee question is at the very heart of not only the question of Palestine and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but more broadly of the Arab-Israeli um, uh, conflict. And that without a resolution and without durable solutions to this issue, and I think they are to be congratulated um, for presenting uh, very clear ideas in this uh, respect, that without those solutions, um, there can be no meaningful uh, diplomatic resolution of these issues. And on, on that note, I think I'll, uh, I'll and my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moeen. Um, we will now move to Professor Marcel Bras, who is a professor of public international law at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, he's also uh, a member of the advisory board of the Rights Forum. Uh, Professor Bras, um, what are your thoughts on, on the relevance of, of the international law framework uh, to address the Palestinian refugee issue? Thank you, Marjolein, for this. And thank you for inviting me for this, uh, this event and to speak here. Uh, and thank you, of course, the authors for their introductions and Muin for his uh, uh, comments. And most of all, thank you, uh, uh, thank you to Lex and Francesca for writing this very important book. And indeed, the question you pose, that is what I would like to address briefly from various angles, namely how important is that this book has come out. We have heard from uh, Francesca and Lex something about the content of the book, 
also about the intentions behind it to put it on the agenda, the whole questions also in the context of the UN developments. But I would like to focus on the relevance of the book. And I would like to do that by stressing three points. One, its comprehensiveness. Secondly, what I think is very important, the fact that we still believe in the role and the power of law. And third, that it also provides practical guidance. I just saw a message in the chat coming by and there was the question, is this book only suitable for international lawyers? And maybe the authors are the persons who want to address what their intention was. But what I can say about it, and that's difficult, I'm a, for 30 years now or longer also as a student, I'm in international law, so I'm not the right person to judge that. But I think this book, and that is my first point immediately, that comprehensiveness, I think it, for the well-informed non-lawyer, well-informed on the Palestine-Israel uh, issues, I think it is a wealth of information which it provides. The history of the Palestinian refugee question is depressingly long, but the developments of the law is also very complex, as also uh, addressed by Francesca. It is not only the, the immediate decis decisions in the 1940s, but also the coming into being of all kinds of uh, conventions in the field of refugee law, in the field of uh, uh, human rights law, in the field of international criminal law, in the field of international humanitarian law, which all come together and which make it a complex uh, 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 situation. So this book, and I think it makes a very good attempt or it succeeds in my view in giving a comprehensive overview of not only the history, how did the questions develop, where did the questions come from, but also how did the take on the role of law in this also develop. And from the various angles, it might be complex for the reader to try to keep abreast with all these different aspects of the law. But I think um, it, is, it is at least important for the, for the as, as a documentation, as a source of information, source of better understanding what the, 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 the law in this area is. And also it provides an analysis. Okay. Moreover, if you start working on this topic, and I, I'm thinking about students, for example, you get lost in, 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 in what is the role of all these actors involved, the UNRWA, the UNHCR, uh, other bodies, the human rights bodies. This book might help them to find a bit what the respective roles are. And also, as Francesca already indicated, uh, trying by giving relevant information and some analysis, uh, also taking away myth that these various actors and various legal regimes are each existing on a separate island. No, they are all connected and they should be looked at in their interconnection, uh, interconnectedness, which is very difficult. When I was preparing for this, I was thinking about the uh, visit we made to Israel and the West Bank to Palestine in 2007 with a Dutch delegation of lawyers uh, to investigate the then state of affairs with regard to the refugee question. And that what we then found uh, is still relevant today. And, 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 and it, we, it seems sometimes that we haven't come very much further. And we only looked at that moment at the person's uh, displaced within now Israel, but also at the, the situation of the uh, refugees in the West Bank, particularly. And we came to some conclusions, and I think the conclusions are still relevant. I think the, the Israel's responsibility under the various regimes, human rights law, humanitarian law, about, and, and also under the uh, refugee law needs, uh, uh, remains very important. Israel as the occupying power has obligations. And that is what Moeen Rabani just also stressed. It should not be pushed to the back of the agenda of trying to solve the Palestinian Israel question. The rights of the Palestinians, especially of the refugees, displaced people should be and should remain on the forefront of the agenda.
And that is an important point which we made in 2007, but it's now still as relevant as then. The fragmentation of the protection and the, which led to the protection gap also referred to by Francesca was indicated then. And, 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 and also the, the difficulties of balancing the roles of the UNRWA and the UNRCR. But the most important point we also saw is, and that addresses a bit Lex's concern about the future and the present, how can we come to a more comprehensive framework for analysis, is that both the UNRWA and the UNHCR do not have a mandate to try to find a durable solution for this situation. They help the refugees, they assist them, but they are not partners, they are not actors in trying to come to solutions. And lastly, the point we made in 2007 is that there seems to be some normalization between brackets uh, of the Israeli oppression and occupation. There are so many facts on the ground created that make return of uh, refugees to their uh, former uh, uh, properties uh, virtually impossible. That is also something which has to be continued to be taken into account. And therefore, this book provides so much information that it is really very helpful and very important at this moment to bring that together. I would have loved to have this book two, uh, 13 years ago so that we would have been much better informed when we went there. And therefore, I think this, this is a very important contribution, not only for lawyers, for academics and practitioners, but also for politicians and for the, what I said, a well-informed non-lawyer who wants to, to get some sense out of this. My second point, let's go to that. If I'm too long, Marjolein, you just uh, intervene. My second point is of continuing to believe in the role of law and specifically now international law. I teach international law now for about 30 years, maybe even more. And I often refer to the situation as Israel and Palestine about how international law tries to play a meaningful role. But it is very difficult when they come, when, when students ask you the question. But if I look at what happens on the ground, how relevant is international law? And if you look at these situations, you really start sometimes to doubt it. And I can imagine people in Palestine, the Palestinians themselves doubt about what the role of international law is. If you're in Gaza, do you believe in international law? I don't think so. But still it is important and therefore, this book makes also an important contribution to continue to say that the law is the backbone for the solutions which we can find. If you must to leave it to the power politics, I think that then the vulnerable people really will be uh, the victim of that. The law is imperfect. The enforcement of the law is imperfect, but every day the law as exists now and as described in the book, is being used. It is not used in a sense that we have solutions for the for the for the for the uh, uh, for the situation, but still people are assisted. UNRWA exists on the basis of legal uh, decisions. The UNHCR protection exists, and individuals and groups make use of that. Uh, we want to see that improved, but. Um, that is something which is is, uh, uh, is is something where we all have to work on. But we have to keep uh, believing in that. And the interesting thing with law is that even without the law itself changing, the interpretation and the application of the law by people who have to work with it changes. And I would like to give as one example, the, the example of August this year in the Netherlands, where a, I would say, courageous judge uh, took the decision to uh, change the, 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 the rules that a person, a Palestinian from Gaza coming to the Netherlands uh, as a refugee would normally in the past would be re re rejected because he falls under Article 1D of the Refugee Convention as explained by Francisca. It is, he is in the care of UNRWA. But this Dutch judge, without looking at the facts on the ground, came to the conclusion that UNRWA cannot provide the, uh, the assistance 
that the minimum assistance needed for a, 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 a tolerable life for this person and said, if the UNRWA is not there, then we have to fall back under, under, under the Article 1A of the convention. That means that he is a refugee as other refugees from situations where they uh, flee from. And that in the, the, the view of this judge was uh, the reason to say he can get a status in the Netherlands. Of course, we have to realize that, that, that there will be an appeal from the Dutch uh, government to, this, uh, to this, this case, and we don't know what the higher courts will decide here, but it is an illustration of the fact that the law has practical uh, implications for concrete persons. Imperfect rules, imperfect solutions, but still of very great importance. Uh, therefore, we should believe in the, in the law and certainly the fact that it provides the bare basics in order to present, prevent uh, violations of, of, of the basic human dignity. And it's, it, 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 it is the minimum standard of protection, at least. And sometimes we want to go higher. Let me go to my last and third point, uh, and that is providing guidance. Uh, it is very difficult for everyone working in this field, whether you're a practitioner, whether you're working as a, in the field officer, or whether you are a politician making decisions on these issues to, to know and to, to know how to deal with these questions. I think the attempt to clarify and interpret the rules as they are there in this book and the roles of the various uh, actors involved, I think Francesca and Lex contribute a lot to people who work with this in practice. It's a bit an overlap with my, my, my previous point, but still it is important. It is uh, complex um, and there is an, it is, it is uh, important that both these people in the ground, the practitioners, as well as the politicians have something to work on. The practitioners to apply the existing law as good as possible and the politicians to work towards future law. And what I, I what Lex told us that we need to put the, the refugees uh, situation of Palestinians into the bigger picture. We cannot see it as a, as a vacuum in the world, which is only, which is single out from other refugee questions. I think it should also not be the other way around. The, the Palestinian refugee question should not be uh, overshadowed by the big refugee questions any elsewhere in the world. But now that we see this process going on in the United Nations, and Lex mentioned the New York Declaration, for example, these are usually important processes. And I think that for, for, the, for, for promoting the Palestinian refugee position, it is very important that they play a role in that process. It's a difficult process and people can be skeptical about what the outcomes can be. It's a lot of words. It's a lot of talking in the United Nations. What does come out of it? We must be realistic. Sometimes not so much comes out of that, but still it's a process which is going on. And I think that the Palestinians and the Palestinian issues should be in the forefront also in the development of that, uh, of that uh, process. But it will be the ultimate solution. I don't know. I think Maureen Rabani also put at very concrete points as of the concrete power of the politics and depending on who will be leaders in influential countries. We cannot predict that. But the only thing which we have as lawyers is to try to protect the law as we have it, apply it as good as possible and develop in a more positive way that law. Shall I stop here? I think it's the uh, right time to stop here. Thank you again, authors, for the for, for this beautiful book, and I hope that many people will uh, benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel, um, and thank you all, uh, all the panelists, uh, for giving us all these relevant uh, different perspectives uh, on the topic and on the book. We have a few uh, questions from the audience, from the from the participants um, that I would like to share with you, and maybe I will I will first share all the questions, and then each of you um, can can give your reactions. Um, one question um, 
comes, I think, from uh, from someone who is a Palestinian refugee from Syria, who is nowadays in the Netherlands. And I think that is really one of the uh, interesting uh, developments. Um, I have also been looking at, um, uh, through my work, we see that a lot of uh, uh, Syrian Palestinians have in the past years uh, took refuge in the Netherlands and for the first time have been able to get a nationality. So they are now uh, Dutch citizens. Uh, we have also seen a lot of developments in international criminal law in recent years and universal jurisdiction. Uh, and I think that is the background to uh, one of the questions that we have uh, uh, in the chat. And that, that question is, um, uh, if a, uh, a palace, if a refugee with with a European nationality uh, would uh, file uh, a personal case in a court, uh, would that be would there be any opportunities for that, and would that have any impact? What what are the chances for that? Um, a second uh, question that we received is. Um, about the framing of the conflict as the Israel-Palestine conflict, which is problematic. Uh, the, the person asking the question states that there is a state Israel on the one hand, and on the other hand, there is a non-state actor. And, and there's nobody that represents the refugees. So, so who, who are the re where are the refugees in the whole debate and, and how uh, are they represented? Who from the panel would like to uh, to react to any of these questions? Francesca, I'm happy. I'm happy to normally Lex and I um, try to give brief comments uh, from both hands. Um, so I, I'll go in order, and I also like to pick up on the question whether our book is accessible to non-lawyers, because I think it's a very relevant question to reach out to a potentially larger public than just lawyers. So if I, uh, if a refugee with European nationality is also interesting, because it's I mean it's a under refugee law, if someone gets a citizenship of state, is no longer a refugee in the sense that doesn't enjoy the protection, the international protection, the protection of the 1951 convention. And in the case of Pal of the Palestinian, there is what we call a residual protection that stems from the fact that they have that element of protection related to uh, the unresolved question of Palestine, the fact that there was the homeland, the historic injustice, and the lack of enjoyment of self-determination. But besides this, uh, if, if a Palestinian with European citizenship files a case in a court, I think it's very relevant because, uh, for example, I assume that this is a, a court of a, crim um, a case of a criminal relevance. This has already been attended in, um, in, uh, in Europe, not necessarily uh, by someone who had a European citizen. It was, it was Palestinian refugees from Lebanon who managed to I don't think they had European citizenship, but however, there was a case brought in Belgium uh, for uh, grave violation suffered uh, in Lebanon during 19, the 1982 Israeli occupation. The case had a huge potential and was blocked for political reasons. And the potential of universal jurisdiction is immense. It's, some, it's something that I hope will encourage other researchers to look into because this is where we have a chance to see the law affirmed in a situation where so far, I mean, looking at Israel, impunity has prevailed, sorry to say, but so yes, other, other especially democracies which offer a guarantee to protection for the rule of law should be should be um, uh, explored. I mean, should be situations where um, uh, accountability to uh, through um, courts should be uh, explored. Um, chances of success, I cannot predict, but there should there should be uh, there should be attempts for it. Um, I, I, I think it was Mohin who said, regarding the second question, um, who said it's a misnomer to, to refer to the Israel-Palestinian case as a conflict. I agree, 
It's the longest occupation in modern history. If we link the past, the present to the past, we see that there is a clear trend of displacement and dispossession. There are people who call it ethnic cleansing, people who do not call it ethnic cleansing, but there, and there is a, a greater reference in the work of UN special rapporteurs and um, scholars uh, to refer to the, surely the situations in the OPT as an apartheid. And these are frameworks that are relevant and these are words that should come into question where addressing the, the paradigm in uh, in, uh, in the Israel-Palestine uh, case, because um, we are captive of uh, language and uh, calling it conflict is, um, is misleading. I agree. Um, the state, not state. I'm not sure I would, I would say that Palestine is not a state because under the um, criteria laid down in 1933 with the Montevideo Convention, uh, a permanent population, a defined territory, which doesn't mean having borders, but a defined territory and the government and capacity to establish and um, maintain international relations, diplomatic relations are the conditions to, to be recognized as a state. The point is that, and, and there have been plans to recognize um, Palestine within the framework of a modern state since uh, since the uh, 19 the, 19, the early 30s and this was what the british mandate was to do the point is that whatever form of state palestine has achieved right now, right now it's strangled by the occupation and the unrelinquished territorial ambitions of israel over the land that remains so the problem is not whether Palestine is a state or not, but why do we have, we still have an occupation after 19, since 1967? This is the question we should pose because this prevents the realization of external self-determination in the case of, of Palestine. It's the, 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 the question of, of the refugees is different. I, um, the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization has, has I mean, was, was born to represent the, 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 the people in the nation in exile and has been a representative, an active political representative of the refugees themselves. Of course, since Oslo, the, 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 the window, the political window has shrunk and, and concentrated on the, on the PA, which represents the interest, I wouldn't say, of the OPT. It's the West Bank right now because there is a divide, an intersign divide between, between Fatah and, and Hamas between the OPT and Gaza. So yes, the Palestinian refugees are without re de facto representatives right now. And this is an issue that is to be addressed. And this is why we advocate for greater representations and for, especially for the donor community to, to help create platforms for representations, especially of Palestinian refugee youth. Um, and then internet, our book was written to be accessible to the large to a large public. So, for example, this the, the, the yeah, as, as a Professor Bruce mentioned, it's complex, but because the question is in many aspects complex, we try to make it as uh, mm, uh, as clear and accessible as possible, including by separating questions that are of general uh, international law relevance, and then uh, 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 de determine how they apply to the case of Palestine, so as to show how law in abstracto and law in practice applies. And of course, happy to hear feedback about how it reads to non-lawyers. <laughs> Yes, Could I, Maureen, yes, please go ahead. Um, I, I realize my three co-panelists are focusing on the law and particularly Professor uh, uh, Bruce and his valuable intervention. And um, while I agree that ultimately this is all about impunity and that individual Palestinians um, uh, can and should have the right uh, to bring legal claims uh, to courts. And Francesca mentioned the Sharon uh, Sabra Shatila case in Belgium. I nevertheless think it's important to emphasize that this is ultimately a question of, of, of politics um, that should be informed by law rather than a question of law that should be informed by politics. I mean, that's also how most issues um, practically are, are addressed. Uh, and resolved. Secondly, uh, with regard to representation of Palestinian refugees, I think it's important to note uh, 
that as a matter of international um, uh, law and diplomacy and Palestinian national consensus, the Palestinian people do have a sole legitimate representative and that is a Palestine liberation organization. And here I'll just put to the side for a moment the disintegration of the Palestinian national movement, the schism um, uh, between Fatah and Hamas and so on. But I would just like to raise one last point, um, and that is that I've, I've always been a bit hesitant about appeals that Palestinian refugees um, should have their own representatives. I've always felt the Palestinians are a people. Um, they have inalienable national rights and they should be represented on a national rather than on a sectoral basis. And actually, if one goes back in history until the Oslo agreements, um, uh, there was very little separate representation or activism for Palestinian refugees. It was only with the fragmentation of the Palestinian people resulting from the diplomatic process that you began to get this kind of sectoral identity-based um, uh, advocacy among um, different Palestinian groups. Now, you know, camp committees, uh, uh, refugee advocacy groups, and so on, um, that's all well and good. But I think the idea that Palestinian refugees should have their own political or diplomatic representation separate from the people of whom they're integral, they're an integral component and a people uh, of whom they in fact form the majority, I think um, uh, is, is, is not a very uh, wise approach to this issue. Just to clarify, I was not calling for. I mean, I was calling for giving representation to the to. Yes, yes, I, I was responding to the story. question rather than to your comment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I thought I had upset you. Maybe if I may, my line. Yes, uh, and there's also an additional question to you in the chat. I don't know if you've seen it. I, I just the saw it about the appeals. If you yes, exactly. That one. Uh, I, I simply don't know. I, I've looked into it today, but I couldn't find it and I didn't have too much time to really s search for it, uh, uh, whether there's the appeal is already, uh, whether the, 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 the state has gone into appeal and whether there's already any action there. Uh, maybe one of the, uh, pan the other panelists may know, uh, but I have to say it as well. I'm not a specialist in refugee law and in, uh, so this is also a field. I want to think you're a professor at law and you know everything, but no, I don't know everything. So uh, that's part. I would like to one, one, one side remark on the very first point you made, uh, the question you posed, whether someone who has now a, a European nationality can file a, a case in court. Sometimes people think that you can file a, any kind of cases in court. And certainly when it comes to criminal cases, it's very difficult for an individual to file a case. In some jurisdictions that's possible, but for the Netherlands, for example, that is not possible. You have the public authorities, the public prosecutor, they decide whether there will be a criminal case against someone. Universal jurisdiction, Yes, it exists, but it's also still very much in a state of development and states start to recognize it more and more, but still to make that in a practical case, I don't want to raise too many hopes there. The, the, the best hope is, is that you have a person or if it's the state, you can as a person, suppose you have gotten the Dutch nationality, you cannot file a claim against the state of Israel or any official of the state of Israel for having uh, uh, done you any wrongs. There's immunity. So there's all kinds of obstacles in the law which make it difficult. So there are possibilities, but there are also many limitations. Thank you. Uh, Lex, may I give you the last word because we're almost at the end uh, of, the, of the webinar. Okay. Uh with pleasure and thank you again uh, for the opportunity and for also for the discussion and the, and the questions from the from the audience and should anybody should anybody among the audience wish to follow up with us with respect to uh, to any of the questions that we did not have the time to fully uh, respond to you know don't don't uh, 
don't be reluctant to uh, to reach out you can find us on facebook our, our emails uh, are, are easily accessible online so feel free to reach out we always appreciate opportunities to uh, to engage with people who are interested in our research uh yeah a few points from my side i uh also want to underscore uh uh that indeed uh citizenship uh or mere asylum uh refugee status uh that's not the does not affect uh, the uh, the enjoyment of other rights and claims that uh Pal the Palestinian the Palestinians in question may may have under international law I mean you know uh, professor Brass spoke about uh, criminal claims but there are the the, the 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 right of return the right to restitution of of property uh, uh, compensation claims etc uh, these are not affected uh, of course they, they they similar to criminal claims these uh, these uh, these are complex and and are in practice by and large blocked at the moment because of sort of political uh, blockages to entertaining such claims. But uh, as we have seen very much with the case of Israel itself, vis-a-vis -vis German with with rep rep reparation claims, you know these 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 sometimes take decades. Uh, both in terms of sort of finding the facts and uh, and uh, and the evidence, uh, and in terms of sort of you know having political institutions entertain the you know the the, the pursuit of such claims. So uh, that should, in our view, not discourage Palestinians from you know doing continuing work to preserve historic claims. And and this is actually helped very much by the work that the Conciliation Commission. Uh, for Palestine did in the 1950s you know when it when it realized it was not able to 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 secure return of refugees it started focusing on documenting in the greatest detail going to the level of individual trees and and parcels of land and 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 both individual and public properties etc the greatest detail the 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 losses uh, of 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 land by by Palestinians have been have been documented and currently there are there are initiatives underway uh, by Palestinians to uh, to preserve those electronically to make them more accessible. There was recently an initiative by the Yasser Arafat Foundation. Uh, IPS has also been quietly working on uh, on the creation of a, of a database based on that data. So there's very important work uh, ongoing uh, and that. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that you know at some point the time will come that it is possible to to move move forward with such claims. Uh, I, I also like to briefly react or, 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 or sort of underscore also my belief in the in the significance of international law and and uh, Francesca has, has, has heard me me say this already in a number of other presentation. It, it reminds me of uh, of my professor inter of international law at the University of Amsterdam many many years ago, Professor Herman Meyers, uh, who uh, told us young students, you know, he said, remember, you have a very important mission ahead of you. The 20th century was that of codification of international law. And, uh, and uh, you know, a lot was achieved uh, in, in, in that respect. Uh, the big challenge for the 21st century, and therefore for you, uh, young lawyers, uh, is to uh, to give international law teeth to work towards the enforcement of the provisions that that uh, that we put in place and and I've that for me has been very much sort of a driving force in my own sort of career as an international lawyer uh, working for um, before that for that refugee council so I, I I really believe you know international law is 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 important and is still very much evolving. Uh, and that's where why we should not we should not give up. Uh, with respect to the appeal for the Gaza case, uh, yes, there was the appeal by the state. There's a very short for apparently for appeals in asylum cases. It's a very short uh, appeals period, uh, and the lawyer for the uh, for the for the refugee informed me that uh, yes, they they already had to submit a brief because we offered some assistance with that. Uh, 
uh, and so I expect that you know it will not take that long before before this uh, this case will be decided on appeal. Uh, and finally, I saw there was a question about you know the status of the PLO. Is the PLO internationally recognized? Does the PLO speak for for Palestinians? I mean, the PLO in the international arena uh, has uh, has evolved into sort of what the uh, UN General Assembly has uh, several years ago uh, admitted uh, Palestine as a, as a non-member. Uh, no, not has admitted Palestine as a, as a non-member state. It has recognized uh, Palestine as a, as a non-member state of the UN because of the of the you know the US uh, the US uh, uh, blockage uh, to be to become a, a UN member. But you know the General Assembly has, with an overwhelming majority, uh, acknowledged uh, that uh, Palestine has sort of you know become a state and therefore the PLO has sort of you know in the international arena become the government of 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 Palestine uh, and 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 does enjoy international international recognition uh and as 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 these things go as, as sort of in the realm of political relations you know we've seen under the Trump administration that the US government has cut off relations with the Palestinians uh and and this is likely to be reversed uh, with the uh, with the incoming Biden administration. I think I'll leave it at that. Again, thank you very much uh, for all of you attending and for very insightful comments. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca Albanese, uh, Lex Takenberg, um, Professor Marcel Bruss and uh, Moin Rabani. Thank you very much for this excellent conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, Francesca and Lex, uh, for, for publishing this book. I hope it will uh, be, provide a framework, but also be an, an inspiration and motivation uh, for many to continue um, uh, advocating for, for a just solution to the Palestinian refugee issue, which is indeed at the core of the Middle East conflict. And um, uh, the link to um, uh, purchase the book is in the chat. And uh, uh, Lex uh, and Francesca, you also invited people to reach out to you after this uh, webinar in case they have additional questions. Uh, to end, I would like to, um, to thank our interpreter, um, Bassam, for providing. Uh, Thank you. And on, on the on the Arabic note, I want to mention that, uh, like with the first edition, there will be an integral Arabic translation of the book uh, published by the Institute for Palestine Studies. So we're very excited about that. It will still take, you know, quite a bit of time before uh, before uh, that materializes. But just be aware that it's in the pipeline. Okay. And once that is available, you will publish that on the Facebook page of the book. Of course. Of course. Okay, and that is also available in the chat. Well, thank you all then, and um, I wish you a good uh, remainder.